Welcome to Unit 8, Evacuation Planning Part 1. This is Dr. John Rennie. The unit objectives this week are to compare evacuation planning policy in the United States with the United Kingdom to evaluate how culture affects human behavior related to evacuation planning and to identify how data and modeling can be utilized in evacuation planning for worst case inundation scenarios. In order not to get behind in this class, you should have completed the midterm, Assignment 1 and Units 1 through 7. This week you have three readings. The first article I wrote called Emergency Evacuation Planning Policy for Carless and Vulnerable Populations in the United States and the United Kingdom. The second, Considering Culture in Evacuation Planning and Consequence Management. And the third is evacuation planning for plausible worst-case inundation scenarios in Honolulu, Hawaii. For the assessment this week, you will need to find a news article about a recent evacuation and provide a summary of the issues identified. Why was there an evacuation? How was it executed? Were there any issues? <clears throat> what were the lessons? Please post your, your response uh, on Canvas forum. You also need to begin working on assignment two. Assignment two is to interview a planner about uh, resilience, sustainability, and <clears throat> um, go on to the forum uh, or go on to Canvas and take a look at the requirements for assignment two. It is due, you have some time to do it. But it will take a while to schedule your interview, so you need to begin working on scheduling that ASAP. This article takes a look at evacuation planning policy for Carlos and vulnerable populations in the United States and the United Kingdom. Some of the key findings include that in the United States, national policy um, at, at, uh, in the United States is based on the National Response Framework. And the National Response Framework is ultimately a policy that says all disasters are local. And when a community is overwhelmed, they have to reach out to the state government. And if the state government is not able to assist, then they have to reach out. The governor has to reach out to the federal government, to the president, to request for assistance. <coughs> In the United Kingdom, they have a national risk assessment policy which sets forward a pretty descriptive approach for evacuation and sheltering, and they call it doctrine. Mm -hmm. And the doctrine includes specific documents addressing how the policy should translate to on-the-ground practice. The evacuation and shelter guidance provides local responders with a basically a toolkit to allow emergency managers to prepare evacuations and sheltering plans for their communities. And the doctrine basically creates uh, this guidance on emergency preparedness and emergency response and recovery that stipulates how these things are done. It's actually quite impressive there in the United Kingdom to see the extent of their plans and policies. They're very well thought out. They are very much inclusive of many aspects of evacuation and sheltering for vulnerable population groups that may not have a car, may not be able to drive. Well, when you compare the two countries, what we see that in the United Kingdom, uh, policy mandates evacuation planning for vulnerable populations from the top down. Whereas in the United States, there are no national evacuation plans or federal mandates for evacuation planning, uh, especially for vulnerable populations. The federal government framework is to aid local governments when request is needed. Regional planning policy in the United Kingdom set forward these regional resilience forums to encourage policy to coordinate planning. 
But through my interviews, I found that they were not necessarily implemented because of the acting governments at the time's desire not to implement regional governance. So while it looked good on paper, it didn't translate into practice. In the United States, at the regional level, we've had a number of initiatives, including um, UASIs, which are urban area strategic initiatives and metropolitan planning organizations that do engage in regional planning coordination, um, but the efforts are mostly voluntary and they're ad hoc across the country. There's no set f straight way, um, you know, formulaic way it's done all across the country. In terms of um, local planning in the United Kingdom, national policy mandates local planning for vulnerable populations but in practice, it's not as active because they haven't had as many disasters in the UK as we've had in the US, although they have had their fair share of terrorism-related events. Uh, they haven't quite had the same level of natural disasters in recent years that the United States have seen. So in the United States, while there may not necessarily be mandates for local planning for vulnerable populations, uh, there has been more experience of you know hurricane evacuation, wildfire evacuation, uh, flooding evacuation um, and and you know other types of you know both uh, natural and human caused disasters that have created a, a lot of experience on the ground level. Uh, when looking at uh, research and practice um, in the United Kingdom, uh, due to the lack of disasters that would necessitate necessitate evacuations among Carl's and vulnerable populations. Uh, practice and research are both somewhat limited, and recent incidents at dry policy have been terrorism focused because that's you know been their biggest challenge in recent years. They've had some flooding events that have prompted evacuations, but it's not been on a large scale like what we've seen in the United States. Uh, whereas in the United States, in terms of research and practice, we see that cities and regions that have experienced a lot of large natural disasters and hurricanes and wildfires are more actively engaged in evacuation planning for Carlos and vulnerable population groups. Um, and since Hurricane Katrina, a significant amount of research funding has supported studies to examine policies, plans, and practice. Although in the United States, you still find in places that have not experienced major threats that their plans are still pretty poor. And while they may think they're prepared, they may not necessarily be. And in the, in the priority uh, level, what we see in the United Kingdom is that um, evacuation planning for Carl's and vulnerable populations is a pretty low-level priority. And in the United States, evacuation planning for Carl's and vulnerable populations is also somewhat low-level priority, unless the region has been struck with a natural disaster and we're unprepared. And then it elevates the priority levels typically for future efforts. We've seen this in many storms over and over again in New Orleans and Florida and Puerto Rico and out west. Wildfires, we see that all over and over again. I founded the National Evacuation Conference with two other partners uh, several years back. We've completed four National Evacuation Conferences. We have had some really top-notch speakers like General Russell Honore, pictured here, who led the response to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and has been um, an author, a uh, general in the Army, and a uh, national leader on uh, preparedness. Another speaker at the National Evacuation Conference is Brock Long, who is the director of FEMA. At the time, Brock was the emergency management director for the state of Alabama's emergency management agency. Um, and he brings a wealth of knowledge regarding evacuations and sheltering and, and uh, responding to disasters. And so I uh, was an honor to have uh, Brock Long as a speaker, and in the last uh, couple of years, he has been very busy responding to all sorts of major disasters all over the United States. The journal that you are reading from is uh, from March, April 2015, Journal of Emergency Management, Emergency Planning and Response.
And uh, this was some of the best articles from the 2014 National Evacuation Conference. The most recent National Evacuation Conference, 2016, we are still working on getting those articles out to press. It typically can take over a year or so. Um, there is uh, the first article that I wrote with Brian Wolshon and Brant Mitchell is, a bit, is an overview, and I'm not going to really go into super great depth talking about that. Uh, you just can read that. It's a short article. The next article that I assigned is considering culture and evacuation planning. Uh, we'll talk about that and evacuation planning for worse plausible um, or for planning for plausible worst case inundation scenarios in Honolulu, Hawaii, which we'll talk about. Why is culture important? Well, I'm not going to read this whole abstract. You can read that. It's in your article, and it's here. You could pause this and read this. Um, but culture is important because emergency managers often do not take culture into consideration when planning for evacuations, and it's critical that they do so. If and when they start to take culture more seriously, they can be more effective in their response. So simply put, culture is important because it makes our evacuations and responses go better. It makes them more effective. And of course, we always want to figure out how we can make our plans and our evacuations more effective. The author describes five principles of cultural proficiency. Uh, they are listed here. Number one, culture is a predominant force in people's lives. Number two, the dominant uh, culture serves people in various ways. Number three, people have both personal identities and group identities. Four, diversity within cultures can be vast and significant. And number five, each individual and group has unique cultural values and needs. So, simply put, we all participate in the American culture, but we are also members of various cultures within the overarching culture. I don't want to use the word subculture because sometimes that has a negative connotation, but in essence, that's what we're talking about, subcultures. Not in a bad way, but in a positive way. Uh, some people have cultural identities tied to immigration communities. My grandparents immigrated to the United States. My parents were first generation. I'm second generation. So growing up, I had a cultural identity with my uh, Italian immigrant, uh, immigrant uh, family. Um, there's religious culture. There is culture related to class, whether you are uh, born and raised in a working class family or a middle class family or a um, wealthier upper class uh, or professional class. There are cultures associated with different regions of our country, the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, uh, the West, California, um, the um, you know, New Mexico, uh, Louisiana, a lot of regional places have very distinct, unique cultures. Uh, Hawaii, Alaska. So understanding culture is so important to understanding how people make decisions. Figure one shows the cultural proficiency continuum. It goes from cultural destructiveness all the way to cultural proficiency with some steps in the middle. Hopefully, emergency managers can learn how to go from being culturally destructive or cultural incapacity, cultural incapacity to cultural blindness uh, to cultural pre competence to cultural competence all the way to cultural proficiency. So that's the goal is to move to the right. When we look at the different features of individualism versus collectivism, and uh, we'll see in the next slide that the American culture tends to focus more on the individualism. We can, and I'm not going to read all of these, but the idea of does our culture promote self-expression, individual thinking, upward mobility, um, you know, are we we are are we more concerned with private property individual ownership which we are uh, cultures that are more focused on collectivism focus more on group interdependence and group consensus and stable hierarchical roles within families um, and uh, understanding of 
how um, things can, uh, you know, property can be shared ownership and group ownership as opposed to individual ownership. Now, again, the U.S. culture is what they call monochronic. It's focused on time and punctuality. The saying, time is money, whereas traditional cultures are polychronic, focused more on consensus and inclusion. Um, the, fo the focus there, the saying there is often more, we'll get around to it in time. Our culture in the U.S. is more task-oriented, whereas traditional cultures are more process-oriented. We, um, in the U.S., uh, look at the rule of law, and no one is above legal authority, whereas traditional cultures is the rule by law. Authorities can make the law, and they can change the rules as necessary. We are highly mobile. We're going to go to where the opportunity is, where we can make the most money, where we can get the best socioeconomic status. Traditional cultures tend to be tied to more specific areas, more multi-generational family ties. And we tend to value and respect accomplishment and achievement. People often ask the question, what do you do? Whereas in traditional cultures, the focus is more on the value of uh, the, the status of the family and the wisdom and the culture. And they ask the question, who are you and who is your family? Now, it's important to note that while we may live in the U.S. with predominant U.S. culture, we do have a lot of traditional cultural communities within our country. So if we don't understand the tr traditional cultural ways of doing things, then uh, we will not be as successful in creating plans that people will follow. So the lessons from this paper is what is the risk of not understanding the culture from an emergency manager's perspective? Well, if you don't understand the culture, you're not going to be effective. Addressing culture does not take much in terms of resources. In the grand scheme of things, the resources are actually quite small to be able to hire cultural brokers. Um, cultural brokers can help make linkages um, and make um, evacuation, emergency management more effective and enhance the readiness and resilience of their plans um, through culturally appropriate dialogue with communities. And we shouldn't sit around and wait. We need to act now. So that was the lessons from that paper. The next paper looked at plausible worst case inundation scenarios for Honolulu, Hawaii. What they did was they first uh, looked at the combined effects sea level rise and episodic hydro meteorological and geophysical events in Honolulu particularly tsunamis and hurricane storm surge um, and they uh, investigated the risks of the community and quantified it then the risks and vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure and surface transportation system are, are described and then third they looked at travel demand software and travel distances and travel times for evacuation from inundation areas and they modeled the time that it would take let's take a look Oahu is a study area and in particular it's the Honolulu area from Pearl Harbor on the west to Diamond Head on the east. This is the Honolulu metropolitan area. So what they did was they took the worst possible inundation area due to sea level rise, tsunami, hurricane storm surge, and inland surface flooding. And they mapped that out based on these uh, grids that represent um, a 100 uh, 100 by 100 um, foot grids. And they um, overlaid that onto the metropolitan area. And they show here in table one the exposure by water depth. So you can see that 58% of the grids are not flooded. Um, there's um, a total of 13,969 grids and of those 8,102 are not flooded. The rest, 42% uh, of the grids have some level of flooding all the way from just a foot or so all the way up to nearly 60 feet of flooding, so quite severe flooding. They then took a look at the exposure of the economy. So they had data on different sectors of the economy um, from tourism um, to uh, health services, retail, other, um, and they, they 
uh, looked at the total sales and they um, basically found that there would be uh, an impact of $34 million in all types of sales um, across all grids. And they looked at employment exposure and found there would be 281,319 jobs uh, impacted by uh, flooding. Then they looked at land and building exposure. So the building value of all the flooded areas would be $27 billion. Um, and the land value would be um, around $29 billion. Uh, this right here looks at the map of the location of critical infrastructure um, by flooding hazard and they have all types of infrastructure from electrical power facilities, communication facilities, uh, bridges, roads, fire stations, hospitals, uh, shelters, and uh, you can see here that the mapping is you know from minor flooding to moderate to major to severe flooding. <coughs> well looking at the types of roadways we see here that there would be um, 18, uh, let's see, it's, uh, not 18 feet, um, the, uh, well, freeways are 18.68, highways are 14.24, arterial streets are 17.7, and total streets is, um, 221.1, um, and I, I don't think that's feet because that seems awfully too small. So um, I'd have to look back in the paper to look at the exact units. But it says feet up here on the top, but I have a feeling that that is not accurate. I think that um, the length of the roadway um, must be greater than, than feet. So um, sorry about that. This looks at the cumulative auto, transit, and commercial vehicle trips associated with the flooding impact. And I'm not going to go into detail into this. Um, this looks at critical infrastructure facilities and the number of different types of facilities, all the way from minor flooding all the way up to severe flooding. And you can see here that um, it's broken down into the type of facility. Uh, so, for example, and, and the, the far right column, inundation impact in terms of percentage, looks at, you know, 80% of communication facilities um, could be impacted, 100% uh, of electric power facilities, um, and then, you know, even 29% of emergency shelters um, could be impacted um, under, you know, kind of the, the greatest levels of flooding. And here it looks at the demographic and evacuation traffic. So this is where they modeled the evacuation time. And uh, what they found is that under severe flooding, there could be a 20-minute delay due to congestion, due to evacuation. 20 minutes could be the matter of life or death um, for certain communities when floodwaters are rising. So very, very um, important um, to look at and model and to figure out how uh, these could be reduced uh, if, um, you know, if, if additional resources or, uh, or people could get out early, for, for example. And this right here just shows the map of evacuation and traffic patterns for a five-foot flood scenario. This ends the Unit 8 lecture. The next unit is Evacuation Planning Part 2. Thank you very much.